So to begin at the beginning, hopefully it'll work. Everything actually worked OK, which is a miracle in and of itself. I always like to begin this class with a story of a conversation that took place in the 17th century between these two guys, Blaise Pascal and Louis XIV. You guys heard of Louis XIV, the guy who built Versailles? you know, And Pascal, the famous French mathematician who has a formula named after him, philosopher. So this is during the Age of Enlightenment, 17th century, the Age of Reason. Pascal asks, Louis XIV Louis asks Pascal, he says, please show me proof of the supernatural. What does Pascal answer? The Jewish people, your majesty. Like, what's so supernatural about us? We invented bagels? If you read what Pascal wrote in his famous essay called Pensis, the fact that the Jewish people had survived till the 17th century, like completely supernatural, no explanation for it. Guys, imagine what he'd say to see us sitting here today. And that's what we're going to see in our little presentation, that Jewish history is comprised of a series of trends and events. Each and every one of them is, let's see how fast this loads, ah, unusual or unique, meaning we call this the seven wonders because there were seven wonders of the ancient world, right? And there, which is the only one still standing? Anyone know? German. Very good. OK. And the seven days in the week, and seven's the number of completion, and seven's as many as I could stick into 45 minutes. By the way, I could do easily 30. This is more than enough. But every one of these aspects, trends, or patterns in Jewish history is unusual or unique. Unusual meaning only happened to a few nations in history. Unique meaning only happened to us. And they combine together to make a history unlike anyone else's. That, by the way, is a great class. Like Ripley's Believe It or Not. Remember, they still publish that book? You know, Ripley's Believe It or Not. You know, like it's just so weird. Jewish history makes no sense. But what makes this class really cool is as unusual and unique as Jewish history is on one hand, it's also predicted. Those two don't go together, right? Like, I can give you a whole class of predictions that'll all come true, I promise, and you will not think I'm a prophet. I'll tell you one, ready? The sun will rise tomorrow. Whoa, OK, that's not so good. Let me give you another one. I'm going to give you a time, a place, and an event. Somewhere in the Middle East, somewhere in the next five years, is going to be a war. Now, by the way, I was saying that way before the Arab Spring turned into the Islamic winter. And even then, no one was surprised. Now, if I told you, but seriously, imagine I'm going to predict tonight. Within 10 years, the entire Middle East is going to break out in peace, industrialization, and democratization, and everyone's going to get along, and it's going to be like the European Union, you know, with a rail line running from Israel to Damascus, and the currency unity, the, you know, the shekel and the drachma come together and make the drekel. It's going to be unbelievable. <laughs> Guys, if that happens, if that happens, I promise you, you're going to call me on the phone and say, like, how did you know that? And can you give me some tips on the stock market? Does everyone see the difference between likely, predictable versus weird and unusual? So all of Jewish history is in the weird and unusual category. And it's all predicted. Where is it predicted? Where is Jewish history predicted? In? In the Torah. There are hundreds of what are called nevuot or prophecies. And we now living over 3,300 years after Mount Sinai can see that everything predicted, no matter how weird it is, is, either has come true or is in the process of coming true. It makes a history unlike any other people in the world. So it's the weirdness of Jewish history combined with being predicted and actually happened that makes us the seven wonders. So here's what we're going to do, guys, for the presentation. For each of these seven aspects, you're going to see like an icon that's going to represent the topic. First, we're going to put it up there, and then we're going to see where it's predicted. We're not going to look at all the predictions. We're not, by the way, cherry picking our predictions, the ones we liked that worked. These are like the main, you can check the bio, bestseller of all time, highly recommended. We're picking like the main presentation, the main philosophical prophetic ideas in the Torah. We're going to see where they're predicted. We'll read a couple of quotes for each of them. Then we'll see, OK, is it unusual or unique? Has it actually happened? That's really important. And does it fit together with the other six ideas? And trust me, guys, a mere 45 minutes from now, you will have a much more profound appreciation why Blaise Pascal says to Louis XIV, if you want to see supernatural, look at the Jewish people. Everyone following me? Am I speaking too fast? No. I get paid by the word, so I try and get as much <laughs> in as possible. But seriously, if, I, if you miss something I say, I have a question, please ask. Let's begin at the beginning. Our first of our seven wonders is the eternal nation. That there'll always be a Jewish people is one of the most oft-repeated themes in the entire Torah. The first place we see it promised is going all the way back to the beginning of Jewish history. Here we have, boom, where is he? Let's hope the quote actually appears. There it is. Genesis 17.7. This is God speaking to Abraham. He's the proto-Jew, the great-grandfather of all of us. What does God say to Abraham? I'll establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you throughout their generation, an eternal covenant to be the God and the God of your descendants after you. So God says to Abraham, between you and I, there's a permanent relationship. You, Abraham, are not going to live forever. But I promise that the Jewish people will always be around. 
as it says over here in, boom, there it is, Leviticus 26. Whoops, sorry. Got a little ahead of myself. Come back. Okay. Thus, even while in the land of their enemies, I will not reject or obliterate them, lest I break my covenant with them by destroying them. For I am the Lord their God. I will remember them because of the covenant I made with their original ancestors, whom I brought out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the nation, so that I might be their God. So guys, for better or for worse, there's always going to be a Jewish people. What's the best proof of this? What's the best proof of this point? We're here. We're here, exactly. Now, by the way, very few people appreciate that we're a nation. You guys got that? You know, I always ask, what is Jewish? Are we a religion, a race, a people, a nation, someone who eats bagels, lox, and cream cheese on Sunday? For some Jews, that's like their deepest connection to Judaism. What are we? We're not a race. How do you know that? Because we come in every size, shape, and color. Here we go. You can see pictures. Montage of exotic-looking Jews. OK. Like I said, my son-in-law and my daughter, it's unbelievable how different they look. Anyone can join the Jewish people. If it's a racial thing, you couldn't join. OK, but it is a religion. But even if you're not religious, you're still Jewish. But it's also a national identity. We have a land, a language, and a history. Guys, we're an ethno-religion. We're a people and a religion together. Sometimes we're sort of like one large dysfunctional family. But not only are we a, a nation and a religion, we're one of the oldest surviving nations on the planet Earth. I mean, you think about it. If you look in the Bible or ancient history books, there's all these peoples mentioned, you know, Babylonians, Hyksos, Phoenicians, Mycenaeans, Assyrians. Like, where are these people today? Where are they today? Yeah. They're gone. If you want to see them, where do you have to go? Museum. A museum, exactly. There are very few people. To find people as old as us, where do you have to go today, really, besides a museum? Asia, pretty much, OK? Like, it reminds me of that joke of a Chinese guy and a Jewish guy discussing how old their civilizations are. And the Chinese guy says, Chinese civilization is 3,000 years old. And the Jewish guy says, yeah, but Jewish civilization, 4,000 years old. And the Chinese guy says, no way. Where did you people eat for the first 1,000 years? <laughs> because, I mean, the people who are more obsessed with Asian cooking are not Asians, they're Jews. I mean, sushi, rabbi, you want to get 1,000 Jews here? Serve all you can eat sushi. If you serve it, they will come. It's unbelievable. <laughs> But seriously, we have outlasted everyone. We may not appreciate how amazing it is we're still around, but a lot of famous non-Jews have taken note of it. Like Mark Twain. You guys heard of Mark Twain? Mm -hmm. Famous American author whose real name is? <coughs> Sorry? What's his real name? Come on. This is going to be in a game show one day. Samuel Clemens, author of like Huckleberry Finn, Tom Sawyer, also the holder of seven patents for suspenders. That's braces for you guys. If that's ever on a game show and you get it right for a million bucks, I want 10%. Okay? What does Mark Twain say? He says, the Egyptian, the Babylonian, the Persian rose filled the planet with sound and splendor, then faded to dream stuff and passed away. The Greek and Roman followed and made a vast noise and they're gone. Other people have sprung up and held their torch high for a time, but it burned out and they sit in twilight now or have vanished. The Jews saw them all, beat them all, and is now what he always was, exhibiting no decadence, no infirmities of age, no weakening of his parts, no slowing of his energies, no dulling of his alert and aggressive mind. All things are mortal but the Jew. All their forces pass, but he remains. What is the secret of his immortality? It's a great quote. By the way, it's such a great quote, I made a t-shirt about it. I figured a couple years ago, if I don't have like a clothing line, no one's going to take me seriously. So this, by the way, the front of it, actually, usually they sell these in the, in the stores in Israel without this. This is my book I wrote, excellent book I wrote on Jewish history. Ask my mother, she'll tell you one of the best books ever written. No, seriously, great, uh, great introduction. But the back is what I wanted to show you. It says, if you can see it, civilizations, nations, and empires that have tried to destroy the Jewish people and their status today. Ancient Egypt, gone. Philistines, gone. Assyrian, Syrian Empire, gone. Babylonian, Persian, Greek, Roman, Byzantine, gone, 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 gone. Crusaders, gone. Spanish Empire, gone. Nazi Germany, gone. Soviet Union, gone. Iran with three question marks. And then it says, the Jewish people, the smallest of nations with a friend in the highest of places. So be nice. <laughs> what do you think? One for every member of the General Assembly of the United Nations. And two for Rouhani, the president of Iran. I'll give him one in black and white for free. It's funny, by the way, a lot of, during the last war in Gaza, someone took my shirt, photographed it, put it on the web, took out Iran and put Hamas and put in progress over here. But <laughs> a lot of Jews are actually afraid to wear this shirt. Like, I can't wear it. Don't kill me. I said, who, a Babylonian? He's gone. <laughs> Just don't, don't wear it in Iran. You'll be fine. Interesting, but who do you think buys all these shirts? The Christians. 
evangelical Christians. I get these emails on my you know, Facebook messages. Rabbi Spiro, I'm down here in Yazoo, Mississippi, wearing your shirt with pride because God loves the Jewish people. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Okay, anyway, if you want one, you'll see me for the special price. Okay, enough commercials. Let's get back to the program. Okay, another great quote. Lev Nikolaevich Tolstoy, one of my personal favorites being a Russian major. Work, work, author of great works of Russian literature like War and Peace, who looks like a rabbi, doesn't he? Let's get this guy like a strimal, put him in Masharim, he'd fit right in. Anyway, what does Tolstoy say about the Jewish people? It's a great quote. He says, the Jew is the emblem of eternity. He whom neither slaughter nor torture of thousands of years could destroy. He whom neither fire nor sword nor inquisition was able to wipe off the face of the earth. He was the first to produce the oracles of God. He has been for so long the guardian of prophecy and who transmitted it to the rest of the world. Such a nation cannot be destroyed. There we go. The Jew is as everlasting as is eternity itself. So guys, Pascal, Twain, Tolstoy, they're all saying the same thing. It's like that old Timex watch commercial, which almost none of you, I'm sure none of you remember. It used to be Timex watches. They take a licking, but they keep on ticking. We have outlasted everyone. So, so far, so good. That's what's predicted, and we're still here. Let me ask you guys, eternal nation, what gives a nation its strongest sense of national identity? What do nations go to war over more than anything else in human history? Land. Exactly. Land. There we go. There's, well, there's land. Okay, here we go. Land. A logical prediction would be eternal nation eternally on its national homeland. That's what we'd expect to see. Okay, that makes sense. What is predicted is the exact opposite because the next idea is, boom, exile and dispersion. Now, before even looking at the reality of what really happened in Jewish history, just hypothetically, in theory, to take a nation, exile and disperse them is a guaranteed recipe for what, guys? Extinction. They're going to assimilate. A few Jews scattered here and there. Remember I said everything in Jewish history is unusual or unique? So exile is, by the way, pretty rare. All those nations we looked at, the vast majority of them were not exiled, yet they don't exist. What happened to them? Someone came in and conquered them, and someone came and conquered them, and they got subsumed and mishmashed and genetically. They're still in there somewhere, but they've long since lost their independent ancient identity. How much more so if you take people out of their homeland, scatter them to other places? So exile is pretty rare. It was practiced by the Assyrians and the Babylonians as a way of pacifying people who rebelled, but it was still pretty rare in the ancient world, in the modern world, like almost unheard of. I think the last people to try it, not very successfully, was the Soviet Union to the Chechnyans in 1936, and look at how well that ended. They're still paying them back for it. So of all the, but not only that, of the few people who were exiled, we're the only one to be exiled more than once, come back and be exiled again. Multiple exiles and dispersion is totally unique to the Jewish people in history. It completely contradicts idea number one, but it's exactly what's predicted if we jump into the, the Bible again, we see, here we go, it should lead to assimilation, when you jump into the Bible, we will see, here it is, boom, Leviticus 26, 33. And you I will scatter amongst the nations the point of my drawn sword, leaving your country desolate and your cities in ruins. I'm going to move over on this side because I keep looking backwards. It will probably be easier for me. Nice cheerful prophecy. Or well, let's look at this one. Here we go. Leviticus 4.26, I appoint heaven and earth as witness for you today that you'll be cut off quickly from the land. You're crossing the Jordan to acquire. You shall not remain there long, for you shall be wiped out. God shall then scatter you among the people, and you shall be left few in number amongst the nations where God will lead you. So we have exile and dispersion. That's what's predicted in theory. Okay, but what happened in reality? So if we look at our Jewish history, if you know your Jewish history, two and a half thousand years ago, the Babylonians will be a vassal state of the Babylonian Empire, which is basically where Iraq is today. The Babylonians, will we rebel against them, they will destroy Jerusalem, and we will go for 70 years to Babylon. So that's where, you know, that's where we get our modern Hebrew script from, by the way. After 70 years in Babylon, according to Jeremiah's prophecy, we'll come back, which is what happens. The Jewish people come back. We have a second commonwealth of 420 years, also known as the Second Temple Period. And we, we go through a lot of persecution. We have first the Greeks, that's the Hanukkah story, that's coming up soon in terms of our Jewish calendar year. And then we have the Romans, and we rebelled more against the Romans than any other people in the history of the Roman Empire, with three major revolts in less than 70 years. Remember, we had the Great Revolt of 67 to 70, leading to the destruction of the Second Temple. We had a thing called Ketos' War, Quietus' War, which probably no one heard of. And then we had the most destructive of all was the Bar Kokhba Revolt. You guys heard of that one? From 132 to 135. By the end of that, the Romans had totally had it with the Jewish people. 
Okay, they even banned us from living in banned us from living in Jerusalem. They renamed it a Roman name, renamed all the cities, renamed the country from Judea to Philistia. And we were basically driven out of our country. This time, we didn't just go to Italy and hang out for 70 years eating kosher pizza. This time, when we're thrown out of the land of Israel, we are scattered around the world, like a driven leaf is the analogy. I'm not, not spitting so well there, but OK, you get the idea. As a driven leaf, from one place to another. Until today, by the way, the three most ubiquitous products on the planet Earth. What does ubiquitous mean? You find them everywhere. Jew, you have Jews, Coca-Cola, and McDonald's. Some places have Jews, Burger King, and Pepsi, but everyone's got Jews. You know, you're going up Mount Everest, climbing to the top. 24,000 feet up, there's a Chabad rabbi. <laughs> Want to fill in before you go? Want some cholent? You know, like that kind of place for Shabbos when you come back down. They made an English television program on Mount Everest. Mount Everest? And they Photographed the week by week as they were going, uh -huh. and when they were coming down, the first people they reached were Israelis. Of course. <laughs> you get to the top, it's another Israeli. Matasepa. <laughs> Israelis are unbelievable. They're everywhere. OK, but seriously, guys, we think it's normal, but it's not. This diaspora experience, which means the Greek word for scattering, we think it's dispersion. It's normal, but it's not. To be a nation without a national homeland for 2,000 years is unique to the Jewish people. There are other diaspora communities. You guys know there's more people of Irish descent living in America than in Ireland because in the 19th century, the potato crop failed. But there was always in Ireland, you could go back and recharge your accent. But we live as a nation without a national homeland for 2,000 years. So it's a unique, it's a unique concept, multiple exiles, dispersion. It totally contradicts the first idea of the notion of our you know, continued existence, yet they're both predicted and they both happened and we're still here. But it does not make any sense. Here we go, unique and boom, gone. Okay, so let's keep going, guys. A little a Ten Commandments quiz. In the, you know, the 613 commandments are scattered throughout the Hebrew Bible, but in the Torah portion in Genesis, the creation story is only one of the 613. Anyone know what it is? Anyone know? Someone, I once asked that and a guy yelled out, don't eat from the tree. <laughs> Which is actually, that's a one-time commandment for Adam. It's, okay, it's not for us. Okay. And that's good. The, I got the answer from the rabbis. At least the rabbis know their stuff. Exactly. Here it is. It is to pru urvu, which means what? Be fruitful and multiply. So do you guys appreciate that's a commandment? Like keep kosher, keep Shabbat, marry young, have as many babies as humanly possible? This is the norm in the Jewish world. And you guys got to appreciate that up until look, pretty much 100 years ago, that was the norm amongst all Jews. Almost all Jews were religious. They married young and had as many kids as humanly possible. Look at your great-grandparents, like my mother's father was one of 11. Uh, certainly more common because there was no Planned Parenthood and birth control. But Jews are the only people who consistently have. The interesting part is today, forget it, no one does except for Jews. Today, it, until today, most Jews are not religious and don't follow that anymore, which explains why, on average, the average American secular Jewish woman has how many kids? <laughs> one and a half, one and a dog. <laughs> no, have... By the way, to keep your population static in the Western world, how many kids does every woman have to have? To keep the population not growing, not shrinking, just the same level? 2.1. Because it's a slight infant mortality rate. I was once teaching a girl's school. This girl asked me what 0.1 looked like. I said an eye, a tooth, an ear, a finger, and half a kidney. She goes, really? I said, it's a statistic, not a real baby. She was all panicking. Okay, <laughs> But, but amongst the ultra-Orthodox community, which is still continuing to do what the Jewish world did throughout history, what's the average? Five. Eight. Eight. My baby sister's got nine. My Rosh Hashiva, Rabbi Noah Weinberg, a blessed memory, the founder of Eshet Torah, his wife has 12 kids. So I still remember, and he has like 136 grandchildren now. But I still remember one years ago, I'm sitting in his office having a meeting with Rabbi Weinberg, and his secretary comes in and says, Mazel Tov, Rosh Hashiva, your daughter-in-law just had twin boys, 104 and 105 grandchildren. And I was like, whoa, Mazel Tov, Rosh Hashiva. First of all, you're no longer a family. Like, now you're a tribe. <laughs> and now you don't travel. Like, you can get to migrate. But this is like a, br <laughs> this is a brilliant idea. Because if I wanted to ensure the survival of my people, I would definitely create this commandment. Because a large, high birth rates are a great counterbalance to what? Everything else. Wars, plagues, famine, infant mortality. So since we are an ancient people like we already saw, since throughout all of our history up until very recently, 
Okay, There's, we've had very high birth rates. What would we expect to see as a logical prediction, guys? There should be a lot of juice. What's predicted? The exact opposite. We're told we're going to be, boom, few in number. Now, come on, guys. A few Jews scattered around the world is a guaranteed recipe for what? Extinction. Yet, what's predicted? Eternal nation. Doesn't make sense. Not only that, few in number, I can't say I'm a world expert in demography, the study of population. But as far as I can tell from my looking into it, what happens is that nations that survive tend to grow very significantly. Otherwise, they disappear. But to skim the line of extinction for so long is unique to the Jewish people, yet it's exactly what's predicted. Let's jump back into the Torah again and we see. Here it is, Deuteronomy 28.62. You shall remain few in number, whereas you could have become as numerous as the stars of the heaven because you would not obey the voice of the Lord your God. You could have been a lot, but you stay small. If you look at the next quote, it's interesting what it says here, also in Deuteronomy. And you shall remain few in number amongst the nations where God shall lead you. Notice where does it say we'll be few in number geographically? Where will we be when we're few in number? Scattered around the world, but specifically it's not mentioned in Israel. Hold, hold, that, hold that thought, because when we get to the end of the class, I want to show you some really interesting statistics about Right, there, there are contradictory places, though. It says there will be as multiple as the stars. No, it says you could have been. You're right, 100%. It says you could have been as numerous as the stars of heaven, but you didn't listen. It's only quite yeah, it's, it's, it's contingent on how we behave. You're 100% correct. What's the difference by, what's your name? Devin. Devin. What's the difference between good and bad prophecy besides one makes you smile, the other you need Prozac for? There's a big difference. One is conditional. It doesn't have to happen, the bad stuff. The good stuff is guaranteed to happen at some point. Usually, that's the way it works. Like, Messiah comes. How? OK, that's up to us. You're right. But it's always conditional here. It's mentioned specifically in the quote we just looked at. So hang on to that thought, because I want to show you something really interesting at the end. OK, let's look at the reality of Jewish demographics. Now, to understand how weird our demographics are, we need a control group. And thank God for the Chinese that they not only are survived along with us, but like the first, co the, the first country to do a census in the Han Dynasty. 2,200 years ago, they did a census. How many Chinese were in the Han Dynasty 2,200 years ago? 30 million. Today, that's like nothing. It's like a square mile of Beijing. But in the ancient world, that's a huge number of people. What's the world's population today? Seven it's over 7 billion. How many, how many millennia of civilization do we have? about 6,000 years. You might think logically, OK, every 1,000 years, the world's population went up by a billion, more or less. Not true. When do you think historians estimate the world's population hit 1 billion for the first time? Total world's population. Mid-19th century. Mid Guys, it took like 5,800 years to get to 1 billion. And in the last like 160 years, the world's population has gone from 1 to over 7 billion. Don't panic. We're not going to run out of room. You know, every year there's some Malthusian end of days scenario. It's ridiculous. First of all, most of the world is sitting empty. But you know, you could stick. You want to hear a totally useless statistic, but very interesting. You could stick every human being alive today standing on the ground in the state of Texas, and everyone has over 1,100 square feet of space. I actually took Rick Perry, governor of Texas, on tour twice. He actually dropped out of for the second time being Republican candidate for president. I told him that when we were in Israel. And he goes, send them all to me. We'll make them all Texans. You know, he's all excited. <laughs> it's actually, by the way, the world's population is going to max out at 11 billion in the middle of this century. That's the estimate. And then crash and burn because no one is having babies. By the way, the Chinese, for the first time in decades, have now allowed people to have more than one kid because they're committing demographic suicide. It was done as an emergency measure to stop the explosion of population. But since the ratio of men to women is so ridiculous now in China. But anyway, but the Chinese had wars, plagues, high infant mortality rates. But their population goes right up to 1 billion, 300 million. Statistically, actually, in this room, I think we do have. OK, are you Chinese? OK, one out of every five. You speak Mandarin? OK, it's the first time I've ever taught this class when I actually had someone speaking Mandarin. In it. I say, statistically, one out of every five of you should be speaking Mandarin, statistically. OK? But, but so guys, if I was, like I said, what would we expect to see from the Jewish people? Ancient people, high birth rates, there should be a lot of Jews. Now, Jewish population, we don't have quite as accurate statistics. We didn't do a census thousands of years ago. Demographers estimate that 2,000 years ago, around the year one of the Christian calendar year, there were five to, about five to seven million Jews living in the Roman Empire, which is huge, by the way. The Roman Empire only had 50 to 55 million people in it. Jews were at least 10% of the Roman Empire and 20% of the Eastern Empire. That's even better than like Brooklyn. I'm telling you, it's unbelievable. And, and another million Jews living in the Persian Empire. 
So five, I would say six to eight million Jews, that's a big range. But even taking the lowest side, they were all religious, marry young, have as many kids as humanly possible. How many Jews do you think should be in the world? You could cheat and look at the graph. No, not the same, because the Chinese had 30 million earlier. No way it should be as many. By the way, I fly on planes all the time. I told you I'm on speaking tours a lot. I love asking non-Jews on planes, how many Jews do you think are in the world? I get numbers that are ridiculous. I've had at least half a dozen Chinese people tell me there's many Jews in the world as Chinese. <laughs> Why do people say that? Because we're scattered all over the place. We're ridiculously disproportionately impactful. And we're also kind of, kind of loud. No, seriously, you know what a guy once told me on an airplane? Everyone in Hollywood is a Jew, got a nose job, and changed his name. I said, you're pretty anti-Semitic, but 50% correct. <laughs> Ever since I found out that Scarlett Johansson is Jewish, like if we could get her to Israel into a seminary, like 10,000 guys would immediately come to Asia Torah. It would be unbelievable. <laughs> so was Daniel Radcliffe, you know, Harry Potter. Daniel Day-Lewis, Joaquin Phoenix. Unbelievable how many. It's a hoot. Yeah, it's unbelievable how many Jews are running around. Anyway, everyone knows Adam Sandler. That's a no-brainer. Guys, nice topic, not our topic. But how many Jews are really in the world? Forget how many should be in the world. You know, the, this is not, I should redo this. The highest number I've seen is 750 million. The lowest number is 250 million. The median number is something like around 400 million Jews. That would be a normal number of Jews given our population 2,000 years ago. How many Jews are really in the world? Boom, like 12 and a half to four, 13 and a half, 14 million, maybe we're not sure. That's insanely low number. It's ridiculous. By the way, statistics. Post-Holocaust, there were 11 million Jews in the world. The world's population by this point has got up about 300% in the last 70 years, which is times three. So if we had just doubled our population, OK, stayed behind, but just doubled, which would be very normal for 70 years, how many Jews should be in the world? It's 22 million. How many Jews are in the world? Maybe two, two and a half million more than 70 years ago. Guys, instead of being what should be the third largest ethnic group in the world after China and India, boom, it should be Jews. We should be there. No, nah, we are 0.2% of the world's population. So is that a complete discussion of the reaction? Basically? No, I don't get, if you don't mind, I'm going to hold the philosophical discussion until after if you want to ask a question on that. Interesting point. But um, just purely statistically, it makes no sense. Skimming the line of extinction, guys, the fact that any of us are here is pretty unbelievable. But certainly, few in number, exile and dispersion, put it together, that's guaranteed. No way we're going to survive. Yet they're, they're all predicted. They've all happened. And we're sitting in this room. So what are we going to see idea number four? What's the next thing we could put into our predictions that's going to make Jewish survival like ridiculously impossible? I once asked that, and a guy yells out, after school Hebrew school classes. <laughs> that was the funniest thing I think I've ever gotten as a response as a teacher. I was laughing so hard, I could not teach for like five minutes. I went through that experience. It was so bad. By the way, the, the reform movement spent millions of dollars to do a survey and found out that kids who went through that had a higher rate of intermarriage and assimilation than kids who had no Jewish affiliation at all. I could have told them that for free. <laughs> Anyone who did that knows what I'm talking about. Why? It's such a painful, meaningless, horrible after school. Who wants to be in Hebrew school after school? No one ever didn't get into Harvard or Yale because they failed Hebrew school, you know? But anyway, <laughs> after school Hebrew school is not predicted in the Bible. What is is something much more serious, which is what? Boom, anti-Semitism. The word doesn't appear in the Torah. The concept is very clearly there. And we're going to see that anti-Semitism is, like everything else in Jewish history, unique. The world is full of racists, bigots, and intolerant people, but anti-Semitism is uniquely irrational and deep and universal. Look what's being predicted, guys. The nation that's going to outlast everyone, including the greatest empires in the world, is going to be few in number, exiled and dispersed, and hated by everyone everywhere, longer and more intensely than anyone else yet survived. Come on. That's what we'd say in baseball. That's rounders for you guys. Uh, three strikes and you're out. So I use, I'm sorry to use the American baseball analogy. After this class, you can ask the Brits to explain cricket to you. As far as I can tell, it's one guy runs back and forth for five days and everyone else drinks beer. I don't know. Although I have to say, the first time my wife watched an American football game, she's like, I don't understand. This huge refrigerator-sized man is bashing into that one and neither has the ball. And why is it called football? No one's foot's touching the ball. It's actually pretty funny, you know. She had another very good observation. Why do Americans have a World Series or only they play in it? <laughs> okay, American Canadians, that, don't, that doesn't count. Okay, anyway, we like Canadians, but it's like the 51st state. Okay, anyway, any Canadians here? Yeah. Who's the Canadian? 
Toronto? I'm also there. Toronto? No? Bathurst Down, just checking. Okay. Okay. Anyway, seriously, but seriously, guys, anti Semitism is a serious topic. And first, let's see where it's predicted in the Torah, and then we'll see why it's unusual and weird. Number one prediction, jump into the Bible. We see in Deuteronomy 26, it says, And those of you who survive in the land of your enemies, I shall make so faint hearted that if leaves rustle behind them, they will flee headlong as if in the sword, though no one pursues them, stumbling over one another as if to escape a weapon while no one is after them. So helpless will you be to take a stand against your foes. You shall perish amongst the nations, and the land of your enemies shall consume you. It's like a pretty, like, intensely negative prophecy there. Look at this one. Deuteronomy 28, among those nations you shall find no respite, no rest for your foot. Their God will make you cowardly, destroying your outlook. You will be terrified, never sure of your existence. In the morning you will say if only every evening, and in the evening you will say if only every morning. Such will be the dread that your heart will feel and the sight that your eyes will see. It's like pretty scary stuff here. Let me ask, has any of you ever lived through anything like this? Ghettos, yellow stars, Jew taxes, expulsion, guys with white hoods burning crosses outside your local synagogue or JCC? Guys, this isn't the weird thing. Our situation is the weird thing. We're one of the few generations, by the way, in Europe, it's ending pretty quickly now. Europe is rapidly becoming completely unsafe for Jews. France is already crazy. Germany, England's not that far behind, I'm telling you. But uh, we're one of the few generations that has grown up in security and peace with equal rights. You don't have to go Why back too far. Why so, we Okay, now, can we just hold on, hold on, hold on. We can't get into that now. We just can't get into that now. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'll come back and do the Why the Jews. I'll come back and do the Why the Jews presentation. We'll discuss that. I know. After the class, we can have a discussion on that off camera. Okay. <laughs> Where were we? Okay. Sometimes a train of thought pulls out of the station without me on it. <laughs> totally lost my train of thought. <laughs> right. Few gener Thank you. One of the few generations that is living in peace and security. You don't have to go too far back in the history of Europe to see things like a little like worse than that and go back a thousand years, really bad. So what's being described is an incredibly intense hatred. Like I said, everything in Jewish history is unique, including anti-Semitism. So what sets it apart? Look at, here's a couple of interesting quotes. First of all, let's start with, look for the quote, start with the definition of anti-Semitism. This is important, by the way, very relevant to what's going on with Israel bashing. And what's the definition of anti-Semitism? By the way, the correct way to spell the word is without the hyphen. Although your spell check will tell you what's wrong unless it's hyphenated. An anti-Semite is someone, what does anti mean, Latin? Against, Against Semites. Who's a Semite? Shem. Shem, Middle Eastern people ethnically are called Semitic. So if, you're, if you hate an Arab, are you an anti-Semite? No. By the way, I get this all the time. I speak on university campuses in America and stuff. People, Arab students will stand up and say, you're the anti-Semite. I'm Palestinian. I live in the Middle East. I'm Arab. You're from Poland. You hate me. You're the anti-Semite. I say, great, not to get into the politics, but complete nonsense. The word was actually invented by a German racial thinker named Wilhelm Marr. This is after Darwinian evolution came around. He wanted to make hatred of Jews sound more racial and less religious, so he invented the word anti-Semitism in his book entitled The Victory of Germany Over Judaism. And in the definition of anti-Semitism since that time has been this definition, prejudice or hostility towards Jews and Jews alone. If you hate an Arab, you are not an anti-Semite. And by the way, for over 100 years, anti-Semitism was the only form of racial or religious intolerance that had its own word to describe it. Think about it. If you hate a black person, what are you? A race, hate an Asian, what are you? Ra Only Jew hate has to have its own word describing it? That should get us thinking there's something different about this hatred compared to any other hatred. And there is. Let's look at a couple of quotes that talk about the uniqueness of anti-Semitism. The first one is from Dr. Bernard Lewis, Professor Emeritus Near Eastern Studies at Princeton. He writes, Hatred of Jews has many parallels and yet is unique in its persistence and its extent, its potency and its virulence, its terrible final solution. Conventional prejudice and persecution can be very terrible, but they differ from anti-Semitism as conventional from nuclear war. He's saying the world is full of racist and intolerant people, but anti-Semitism is a uniquely intense form of hatred. Or well, this quote from Dennis Prager and Joseph Telushkin in what is an excellent book called Why the Jews. By the way, we're not going to go into the real reason for Jew hate, which is a great topic, interesting, kind of scary, but not for us tonight. I do have a presentation. I'm pushing for myself to come back already. I do have a really good presentation called Why the Jews, which deals with this topic. Happens to be when we came out with our presentation, Prager and Tolution came out with a book with the exact same title, which makes the exact same point. It's like the tipping point, Malcolm Gladwell, you know, sometimes ideas just pop into the world. 
But look what they write. Hatred of Jews is humanity's greatest hatred. While hatred of other groups has always existed, no hatred has been as universal, as deep, or as permanent. Meaning there's aspects of anti-Semitism that set it apart. Specifically, what they focus on are these aspects. Universality, intensity, longevity, and irrationality are the four things that set anti-Semitism apart from other hatreds. Just to touch on each of them for a minute. The universality of anti-Semitism that makes it unique is that hatred of Jews, unlike other forms of hatred, hatred of us isn't linked to our relationship with one ethnic group, one religion, one race, one nation. Wherever we go in any significant numbers, it follows. It's the most universal hatred in the world. Number two thing that sets it apart is the intensity of anti-Semitism. I mean, the dictionary definition might be prejudice or hostility towards Jews. But guys, imagine if the, the worst thing that ever happened to us was like we couldn't get into some country clubs and they made some jokes about us. Remember, in America in the 19, you know, even up to the 50s, 60s, there were country clubs that were you know, restricted. Remember Groucho Marx or the Marx Brothers used to say, I wouldn't want to be the member of a country club that would have me as a member. If that's all anti-Semitism was, no big deal. But if you look at the history of anti-Semitism, you see it is by far the most intense this is supposed to rotate through the pictures here, very, going very, very slowly for some reason. But it's the most like, incredibly violent hatred in human history. It's an unending list of persecution, expulsion, ghettoization, humiliation, punitive taxation, rape, pillage, beating, up to what's the worst thing you can do to a people you hate. Exter what do you call exterminating a people? Genocide. Genocide. Who invented the word? A Polish Jewish refugee in 1944 invented that word. His name is Dr. Rafael Lemkin. If you don't believe me, look it up in the source of all knowledge after God called Google, which will probably take you to Wikipedia. But seriously, Lemkin fleeing from Poland to England during World War II and the Holocaust, he says it's a crime happening in Europe. There's no word to describe. And he invents this new word, genocide. Even that word had to be created to describe the unique <laughs> intensity of anti-Semitism. So that sets it apart. The third thing it sets it apart is the longevity. Like we have been around, like we saw in point number one, longer than almost anyone else. And anti-Semitism is as old, this is moving very slowly, but it's as old as the Jewish people itself. When Thames Television did a TV series on uh, anti-Semitism like 30 years ago, the title was Anti-Semitism, The Longest Hatred, because it is. I can show you it all the way in the book of Genesis where it begins. And last but not least that sets it apart is the reasons for anti-Semitism, specifically the irrationality. I mean, think about it. Ask like a bunch of white supremacists to put on a whiteboard. They never use a blackboard. Why we, don't like, why we don't like black people, they'll give you like 10, 12 stereotype, horrible things black people supposed to do, supposedly do. Ask Jew haters to put on a whiteboard or blackboard why they hate Jews. They'll fill up 15 whiteboards. We hate those Jews because they're capitalist, communist, warlike, passive, different, the same, strong, weak, dominant, lazy, servile, aggressive. What's weird about the list, guys? A, it never ends, and B, it contradicts itself. Michael Curtis, Professor Michael Curtis at Rutgers said it the best. He said, anything and everything is a reason to hate the Jews. Whatever you hate, the Jew is that. <laughs> what? Like, you put it together, and you got the most crazy, ridiculous, violent anti-Semitism in the world in a category by itself, and combined with few in number and exile and dispersion, like three strikes and you're out. There's no way a nation's going to survive. They're all unique. They're all negative. They're all predicted. They've all happened, and we're still sitting in the room. What would you expect to see from a nation that's gone through such a history, guys? Here we go. This is really moving slowly. I apologize. What would you expect to see from a nation that's gone through such a history? They should be gone. In contradiction to all logic, the author is not only going to have us survive, which is a pretty amazing accomplishment, we're going to be a light to nations, which doesn't make any sense. Now, if I'm an expert on any topic, it's this topic. Remember the definition of an expert? That someone knows more and more about less and less till eventually knows everything about nothing. Just joking. But the, the first book I wrote, I even have a Hebrew version of it. But none of you guys, any of you guys Hebrew speakers? The first book I wrote is called World Perfect, which is actually my master's thesis, just proving you can monetize your education. Um, but I had to rewrite it for the book. But this is the ultimate Jewish bride book. Another good book. Again, ask my mother. She will definitely confirm that. It's a great story. but So I could speak a lot on this topic. I have a whole presentation just on that. But in the context of this class, we'll see it makes absolutely no sense. First, let's see what's predicted. Then we'll talk about the light we've supposedly been to the nations. So jump into the Bible. And Genesis 12, God speaking to Abraham at the very beginning of Jewish history says, I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. You will become a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. Through you, all the communities of the earth shall be blessed. By the way, a little side point. 
Who are Israel and the Jewish people's greatest ally in the world today? Christian. Evangelical Christian right. You know why the number one reason is this quote from the Bible, specifically, I'll bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. They take the Bible more seriously than we do most of the time, and they think God's going to bless those who are good to the Jews. I want to be on the side of righteousness. I, they tell me this all the time, which is why they buy my T-shirt. <laughs> Not our topic, but we're being told that the whole world is going to be blessed through the Jewish people. But what does it mean? It's kind of like vague. So if we jump into Yeshayahu, Isaiah, he says, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will hold your hand and keep you, and I will establish you as a covenant of the people for a light to nations. That's where the expression comes from, the famous Laor Goyim. But it doesn't explain what that means. So go to chapter 60 of Isaiah, and he says, For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and a thick darkness, the nations, but God will shine upon you. Nations shall then go by your light, and kings by your radiant illumination. Like, isn't that beautiful? Nations and kings will follow the Jewish people. Guys, time out. Are we in the same universe here? Just think about it psychologically. You want to be like people you like or people you dislike? Like, duh. <laughs> people you like. <laughs> like little Jewish kids don't go, Daddy, when I grow up, I want to be like Adolf Hitler. You know, it's not, it's not that. What's the image of us in the collective consciousness of the non-Jewish world throughout history? Is it a positive one or a negative one? Negative. By the way, medieval, thank you. In medieval Europe, Jews are literally the devil. Okay, but there have been people who have not been well liked, but have had a huge impact in the world. I'll give you a couple of examples. I bet you studied them. The Greeks and the Romans. You think people liked them when they were around? I can guarantee you not. In hindsight, with Greeks, Romans, how are they so impactful? If, any, if everyone hated them, what's the most famous? What's the most famous military dispatch probably in all of human history? Julius Caesar writing from Gaul. 2,000, like 40-something years ago, 50-something years ago, Wenny Witty Wiki. Anyone heard that? Mis mispronounced by Americans who don't know Latin as Veni Witty Wiki? What is Wenny Witty Wiki? I came, I saw, I conquered. Remember the motto of the Roman Empire? Travel to exotic places, meet interesting people, subjugate and tax them. <laughs> Empire, we conquer you and stuff our values down your throat, our laws, our taxes, our roads, our architecture. That works for them, but not for us guys. We're few in number, exiled and dispersed. Everyone hates us. The only Jewish empire in history has been Hollywood. <laughs> Complete creation of the Jewish people. By the way, the book about Jews in Hollywood is called An Empire of Their Own, the book on the topic. So it's a complete creation of Jews and certainly not a source of Jewish values. But guys, given that everyone hates our guts and we're in no position to force our values on anyone, how in the world are we going to be a light to nations? Yet arguably, we, the Jewish people who shouldn't even be here, have had a far bigger impact, this is the point I make in my book, than the greatest civilizations in the ancient world. And besides obvious great Jewish contributions to civilization, like guilt, bagels, junk bonds, leverage buyouts, Einstein, Marx, Freud, 23% of all the Nobel Prizes since 1900, 24% of the Fields Medals in Mathematics, 25% of the Forbes list of the wealthiest people on the planet Earth, and all that other great Jewish trivia, what has been the greatest Jewish contribution to the world? What do you think, guys? One God, brought to you by the Jewish people. One God and one absolute standard of morality that comes from God. Call it ethical monotheism, whatever you like, but there's no question, hands down, in the terms of spirituality and morality, it has been the most transformative idea in human history. Arguably, it's the most transformative idea, period. Now, trust me, I could talk about this for a long time. We don't have time. I want to just share with you one person who appreciates the impact of one God on morality in the Jewish people. John Adams, second president of the United States, one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence, one of the founding fathers. What does John Adams say? I will insist the Hebrews have done more to civilize men than any other nation. If I were an atheist and believed in blind eternal fate, I should still believe that fate had ordained the Jews to be the most essential instrument for civilizing the nations. If I were an atheist of another sect, I should still believe the chance it ordered the Jews to preserve and propagate to all mankind the doctrine of a supreme, intelligent, wise, almighty sovereign of the universe, which I believe to be the great essential principle of all morality and consequently of all civilization. They are the most glorious nation that ever inhabited this earth. The Romans and the empire were but a bubble. They were like nothing in comparison to the Jews. They have given religion to three quarters of the globe and have influenced the affairs of mankind more and more happily than any other nation, ancient or modern. And if he were running for president today, I would definitely vote for him. <laughs> And again, I don't have time to go into it, but in the course of researching my book, I came across dozens of presidents, prime ministers, philosophers, historians, thinkers. They all say the same thing. The Jewish people basically civilized the world. Pretty cool. 
So let's go over to item number six. We're getting close to the end here. Item number six, by the way, is pretty weird. It's like a different direction than what we've looked at until now, but it's called the interdependency of the Jewish people in the land of Israel. Guys, to appreciate this point, we have to first appreciate a little bit of geography. I'll explain what interdependency means in a minute. Now, I know geography is not the strong point of Americans, especially. You know, Ambrose Spears, who wrote during the American Civil War in the 1860s, he has one of my favorite quotes. He said, war is God's way of teaching Americans geography. <laughs> I have students who can't find Mexico on a map, but they can name every city on the Euphrates River in Iraq today. But think about it. Here's the land of Israel. I made it easy for you. There is Israel over there. You can see on the map, out in the dark brown. In the eastern Mediterranean, which, by the way, the Mediterranean is the most important body of water in the Western world. Not only that is Israel on the Mediterranean, but it's also a land bridge. What's a land bridge, guys? It's a, piece, it's a piece of land that connects two different continents. Which two continents? Asian, Asian Africa. Asian Africa. That's why the other one that's really important is, of course, where Turkey is, the Bosporus, which is, connects Asia to Europe, at least that, the lower part, which is why it's so strategically important. If you want to walk from Africa to Asia, you have to walk through the land of Israel. So strategically, Israel is in an amazingly good location. But not only that, you know, the Bible describes the land of Israel, that famous quote, it's Eretz Zavat Chalav Vidavash, a land flowing with milk and honey. And the land of Israel thousands of years ago, by the way, was a beautiful, green, lush piece of real estate. It was sort of like Seattle, Vancouver, Pacific Northwest, Israel 2,000 years ago. I know that, uh, what is it, Ashdod or Ashkelon got 93 millimeters of rain in an hour. That's not, but Israel, unbelievable. You see the pictures? Like the whole city was flooded in like three feet of water. But Israel 2,000 years ago got more than twice as much rain as it gets today. It was covered with forests valuable cash crops like wheat and oil, dates, barley, all that stuff. And there were lions and bears running, no tigers, lions and bears running around here up until 500 years ago when the Turks hunted them into extinction. You guys know Josephus, Flavius Josephus, the great Jewish historian from the first century who's known to be very accurate in terms of his physical description of the land? Look what he says about the land of Israel 2,000 years ago. For the whole area is excellent for crops and pasturage and rich in trees of every kind so that by its very fertility it invites even those least inclined to work on the land. In fact, every inch of it has been cultivated by the inhabitants and not a parcel goes to waste. Agricultural historians will tell you that 2,000 years ago the land of Israel was the most extensively cultivated piece of real estate in the Mediterranean which made it incredibly valuable. So take the strategic location combined with the economic, remember agrarian civilizations, pre-industrialized. Israel was probably the hottest piece of real estate in the, ancient, in the ancient world, certainly in the Western world. So what are you as Caesar, Alexander the Great, Pharaoh, what are you going to do as you're marching around the world building your empire? You're going to march into the land of Israel with your conquering armies. What's going to happen to us, the Jewish people, the indigenous? Killed, expelled, enslaved, subjugate, whatever. It should have been, bye-bye, Jews, hello, so many other people who came after us. Guys, we should have been sitting at the bottom of a layer cake of extinct civilizations. Mm -hmm. But the author of the book says, uh-uh, you are people guaranteed to survive. You're going to have a unique impact on the world. And the only place you can really accomplish your destiny is in the land of Israel. I told you guys I'm a tour guide. When I explain that connection, I always use the analogy. I go on speaking tours. I learned the hard way that every country has like a different voltage and a different size plug. Like the one in England, you need like a separate suitcase for it. This big thing, South Africa is even bigger. You don't have the right plug or the right voltage. Your appliance doesn't work. Guys, the only place in the world that we can plug into and function at peak efficiency and achieve our potential is the land of Israel. So this interdependency idea means that the land of Israel will react uniquely to us versus everyone else to ensure that we'll always have access to it when we long ago should have lost access to it and disappeared. You guys ever heard of such an idea? Like land knows who's living on it? Land doesn't have a consciousness. But look what's written. Look what's predicted in the Torah. Leviticus 26. So devastated will I leave the land. Your enemies who live there will be astonished. Your land will remain desolate and your cities in ruins. Nice positive prophecy. Jump down to this one. Ezekiel 33. And I shall make the land a desolate waste so that its proud strength will cease. And the mountains of Israel shall be desolate. No one will cross them. So guys, if we make a graph of, one more graph for the day, of re re Jewish population in the land of Israel versus what happened to the land, we see a striking comparison. With the disappearance of the Jewish population, which takes place primarily from the first to the fifth centuries, during the late Roman and Byzantine periods, by the time you get to the 400s, like 99% of the Jews have like left the land of Israel. It doesn't mean like last Jew leaves on last ancient El Al flight. There was always a couple Jews here anyway. All the potted plants dropped dead the next day. 
but there's a direct relationship between the dwindling Jewish population and the productivity and the greenness of the land of Israel, which only gets much worse in the last few hundred years, by the way, especially during the Ottoman period. You can see, where are we? Here we go. That beautiful land of milk and honey 2,000 years ago, boom, turns into a desert wasteland, which is pretty weird, but which is also, by the way, guys, a huge blessing in disguise. But Mark Twain, remember whose real name is? Who has seven patents for? Six. You learned something tonight, OK? Mark Twain writes, he wrote a book called Innocence Abroad. And look, what, look at his description of the land of Israel from, from the 1860s. We traverse some miles of desolate country. Soil is rich enough, but is given wholly to weeds. A silent, mournful expanse. A desolation is here that not even imagination can grace with the pomp of life in action. We reached Tabor safely. We never saw a human being on the whole route. And he goes on to say, at the end, no landscape existed is more tiresome to the eye than that which bounds the approaches to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is mournful, dreary, and lifeless. I would not desire to live here. It is a hopeless, dreary, heartbroken land. Palestine sits in sackcloth and ashes. What are sackcloth and ashes a sign of? Morning. Now, by the way, Mark Twain is an agnostic. What's an agnostic? He's not an atheist. He's not sure. Okay, he's not a religious guy, but he's using very religious language. Reminds me of a funny joke. What does an agnostic, dyslexic, insomniac do? Stays up all night wondering whether is or isn't a dog. Okay, anyway. <laughs> No, seriously, Mark Twain, he's not, but he's using this biblical language of like sackcloth and ashes. You know, the land is in mourning for what? The loss of the children. Like the land's mommy, we're the kids. I see when my wife, you know, when there's no kids around, my wife gets depressed. On Shabbat especially, she can't take it. She wants them there. By the way, this is weird. Like land knows who's living on it? No way. By the way, it's a huge blessing in disguise also. Why do I say a blessing in disguise? Let me give you one more example here. Go to America, North America. 400 years ago, US Canada, they should have put Canada in there. I don't know why they left it off, but how many, who lived in America before white people invaded? Indian. Native Americans, okay? How many of them were there? We don't know, but between 750,000 and maybe two and a half million. You know there's more people living in Manhattan today than all of North America 400 years ago? And I'm not being nasty, just true. They were Stone Age. No metal tools, no writing, almost all nomadic. How much damage could they do? There were so few of them. In comes the white people, slaughters the indigenous population, exiles the survivors to reservations, cuts down the trees, builds railroads, builds cities, pollutes like crazy. Does America turn into a desert wasteland because the indigenous population is obliterated and exiled, like what happened to the Jews? My, my wife says, culturally, absolutely. American culture is an oxymoron. <laughs> What's an oxymoron? Another Greek word. Two words that don't go together. Like, she, like she goes to, like American history. Then, I, you know, like French military victories, you know, uh, mil military intelligence, jumbo shrimp. I say back to my wife, British cooking. <laughs> and then I don't get dinner for like a year. It's unbelievable. <laughs> Seriously. Why is it a blessing in disguise? What happened to us? What, what chance do you think the Native Americans have, like, like 400 years later, 2015, of getting any part of North America back and creating an independent state? By the way, America not only doesn't turn into a desert wasteland, it builds the greatest economy in human history without an empire. So forget that theory about land indigenous. They're, they're big enough. No, but, but what, ha what chance do the Native Americans have of, of zero? What chance would we have of, of having, finding our land, sitting the most valuable piece of real estate in the ancient world, sitting grossly, totally undeveloped, with a teeny population that was shrinking in the 19th century, by the way? In the land of Israel in 1880, like 400,000 people living in it? Jerusalem has more than twice that population today. So the whole thing is weird. The land sits empty. The mummy is, you know, she's barren and depressed, waiting for the children to come home, which brings us to our last final of our seven wonders, which is the one I like the most because it's positive. And it's, it's the one you see happening right before your eyes every day at Ben Gurion Airport, especially if you arrive when a Nefesh Benefesh flight lands. You guys know Nefesh Benefesh? Anyone make Aliyah through Nefesh Benefesh? OK. So that's the organization that's, that this Jewish agency has outsourced Aliyah to. But it's the notion of return. Guys, this is a unique event in human history. No nation ever went through the history we did. Came back and reestablished a state thousands of years later. Yet it's exactly what's predicted in the Torah where it says, Deuteronomy 30, and the Lord your God shall return you from captivity, have compassion upon you. He shall return and gather you from all the nations. And the Lord your God will bring you into the land you inherit, your fathers inherited. You will acquire and he will make you even more prosperous and numerous than your fathers. Or if we jump into, boom. Jeremiah 31, for thus says God, shout with joy for Jacob, exalt at the heads of nations, proclaim your praise and say, O God, deliver your people, the remnant of Israel. 
Behold, I will bring them back from the northern lands and gather them from the ends of the world. I think the Torah was talking about London and Brooklyn. <laughs> northern lands, end of the world. OK, probably west coast of California qualifies for that. But seriously, guys, this is a unique event that you could see happening every day. Go to the, you, ever, you can actually go when Nefesh Benefesh has flights. You show up at 5 AM. They go to the old terminal, number one, and they, they land on the runway. And people are kissing the ground and crying, and everyone's waving flags and singing. It's unbelievable. But guys, we don't appreciate how supernatural it is, what's happened in the land of Israel in the last 70 years, or even 100 years. Think about it. 100 years ago, not to 1,000 years ago, great-grandparents at most, what percentage of Jews in the world lived in Israel? You can cheat and look up there. <laughs> Half of 1%. Fast forward to today, guys. 115 years later, what percentage of Jews in the world live in Israel? About half. You know, there are more Jews living in Israel than probably any time in human history, certainly since the first temple, and probably more than even in the first temple. Israel is now considered by demographers to be equal or possibly exceeding the Jewish population of America. The two combined have like 90% of the Jews in the world. Given current trends of disappearing diaspora Jew and rising Israel's population, within 10 years max, for the first time in two and a half thousand years, the majority of Jews will be back in the land of Israel. Remember what I said with few in number? That since the end of World War II, 70 years ago, the world's population has gone up 300%, three times. The Jewish population has barely changed. I've gone a couple million. What's the population of Israel done in the last 70 years? It's gone up 1,000%. More than three times what the world's population has done. Guys, the fastest growing population in the last 70 years is not the Chinese in China. It's the Jews in the land of Israel. It's an unbelievable statistic. But flip it over, number six, if the land is barren when we're gone, what happens when we return? Talk about good and bad prophecy. What's going to happen? The land will bloom again, as it says, boom, in Ezekiel. Is it, is it referring to like produce or is it referring to like the uh, uh, Hold on one second. Wait. It's referring to, we'll see, it's referring to everything. Especially, first and foremost, it's agricultural, for sure. Look at the prophecy. It's right here. As for you, mountains of Israel, you shall shoot forth your branches and bear your fruit for my people Israel, for the return is close at hand. For behold, I am with you, and I shall, and you, I shall turn to you. Then you shall be tilled and sown, and multiply men upon you, the entire family of Israel. Now, by the way, you have to keep in mind with all prophecies that this is, in, this is an agrarian society. Just like the prophecies about Gog and Magog talk about the nations of the world coming against Israel with chariots and horses, the point is not to take it literally. Because if they had said airplanes and tanks, no one 3,000 years ago had any idea what they're talking about. If they said high tech, they'd go, what's tech? You know, like, so it's a general thing that the land will be prosperous and bloom and be, you know, it's, it, it's an unbelievable thing. And we don't appreciate this point. But guys, just to give you a little bit of a, when was Israel founded as a state? When did the Holocaust end? 45. 45. When was Israel founded as a state? 48. 48. 48. Three years after 70% of the Jews in Europe were killed. The remnants straggle into this desert wasteland surrounded by 45 million hostile Arabs in a constant state of warfare, terrorism, and economic blockade, a completely undeveloped third world country, constantly fighting wars, terrorism, having to absorb millions of immigrants, which is a huge strain on a developed economy. Yet within a couple of years, after the founding of the state in a constant state of warfare, the land is blooming. The desert is exporting fruits and vegetables to the rest of the world. That Holland, the largest flower exporting nation, imports flowers from Israel to export to other countries is pretty funny. That Israel is the only country in the world that has more forests at the end of the 20th century than the beginning. You know, the JNF has planted 250 million trees in the land of Israel in the last 100 years. That there's more high tech in Israel per capita than any other country in the world. That outside of Silicon Valley, there's more here than anywhere. That the NASDAQ technology shares, you know, that Israel's the third most traded country in the world is crazy. That Israel was removed from the International Monetary Funds list in 1998 and listed as a fully developed first world nation with the, with the top 25 standards of living in the world equal to that of Great Britain's, done in less than 40 years. Guys, done in f less than 40 years, in a constant state of warfare, terrorism, economic blockade with no natural resource. Remember what Golda Meir said? I'm really angry at God. He brought us, he made us wander the desert for 40 years, then he brings us to the only place in the Middle East with no oil. <laughs> <laughs> you want to hear an amazing statistic, by the way? Teeny tiny Israel, 10 and a half thousand square miles with the territories. Six million Jews surrounded by 22 Arab states of the Arab League with 330 million people take oil out of the equation, meaning the Arabs don't have it. Teeny tiny Israel's gross domestic product exceeds all 22 states of the Arab League combined. So now we have oil. Now we have oil too. Yeah. See, thank God. And shale and gas and bar. But ha think, it's unbelievable. Guys, we don't, uh, now we're getting to the nice pictures, so it's dramatic. <laughs> it's shook. We don't appreciate how supernatural it all is. But imagine our great-great-great-grandparents 
sitting in some shtetl in Poland or something, in, in, in poverty and persecution in Tsarist Russia or somewhere in the Middle East. Imagine what they would see to sit a, see us sitting here today. Tel Aviv was a sand dune 100 years ago. It's unbelievable. When I came here, the tallest building was the Shalom Tower. You know, it's like nothing here, even 30-something even years ago. Guys, we don't appreciate how supernatural it all is. You know who summed up this class better than anyone else? First Prime Minister of Israel. He's coming on eventually, David Ben-Gurion, who was not a religious man by any stretch of the imagination, but who knew his Jewish history and his Bible better than any rabbi. You know what Ben-Gurion said? A Jew doesn't believe in miracles is not a realist. An amazing quote for a man having a very bad hair day. <laughs> I have this theory that's why Albert Einstein didn't become president. He was offered to be president. Yeah, have two of them. Can you imagine Einstein and Ben-Gurion posing for pictures? <laughs> that's ridiculous. Okay. <laughs> Seriously, guys, how could you say this? Okay? He but, but anyway, he did. He was buried in the, He's actually buried in the Negev. How could you say this? Guys, he, but look at Jewish history. Let's get to our final. We'll go back to what we started at the beginning here. Jewish history is combined of a series of trends and events. Look at these. All of these are unusual or unique. They combine together to make a history unlike anyone else's. We looked at seven. I could do another 20. We don't have time. I think I made the, the point for sure. No problem, but I could keep going in this class for another three hours. Guys, no nation in history has a history like this. No Las Vegas bookie would give you a million to one odds of this history actually happening. Yet we sitting in this room 3,300 years after Mount Sinai, we're like living proof of the supernatural. What does it show me? First of all, it shows me that history acts as incredible outside verification for the Bible. That that which is predicted in the Torah is that which happens, regardless of how much sense it makes. But on a higher level, which gives me the real high personally, is that it shows me the hand that wrote this book is the hand that not only clearly controls Jewish history, but the hand that controls all of human history. And guys, thank you very much. Thank you.